Thank you everyone for actually being here today. This is part five of our instructional liturgy. For those who are here from part one to four, the instructional liturgy is a way to explain what the Armenian Church Baldarak is. What do we believe? Why do we believe it? Where it came from, etc. And then once it's completed, we're going to continue with a shorter, from Haidemir, a shorter uh, service of worship, of communion, and of thanksgiving. But because there's so few of you, I'm going to hope that you all know the answer from the, the review. So from part one, what is a sacrament? Anybody? Chorurta. What is a sacrament? A mystery, a public expression of our faith, which is in turn express, expresses a mystery or an unseen reality of our faith. How many sacraments does the Armenian Church have? Seven. Uh, anybody know those? Communion, penance, chrismation, baptism, marriage, ordination, and Unction, final anointing. Anybody know them in Armenian? No? Okay. What is the foundation of Badarak? What are we remembering? Mm -hmm. Jesus' sacrifice. What else? The Last Supper. What does liturgy mean? Right? We say divine liturgy. What does liturgy mean? Pauline is not here for me to ask her, so. What? No, what did you say? No, liturgia. liturgia. Which is a Greek word meaning what? The work of the people. So, part two. How did the original church remember the Last Supper? What do we do after Badarak, after church, downstairs? The fellowship, right? Siro Josh, or Agape Meal. This, of course, eventually came to be a separate celebration from Badarak. How many parts does the Armenian Divine Liturgy have? Two. Which are those? The Word. The Word, so the teaching, or synaxis as a fancy word. And then part two? Hmm? The Liturgy. Not the Liturgy, the second part of the Divine Liturgy. Oh. The Eucharist. Koha Panutsun. How many, okay, so we said that. Part three, how does the first part of the Badarak begin? The vesting. vesting, meaning what? <laughs> what? What does it mean when somebody's vesting? When, when somebody's getting dressed, what are they doing? Preparation. Preparation. How many pieces are there to the Armenian priest's vestments? A lot. <laughs> Eight, the alb, the shavig, the porura, the stole, kodi, the belt, baspans, the cuffs, the vagas, the cope, the crown, and the slippers. What is the purpose of priestly vestments? Why do priests dress up? As a symbol. Of what? Of eternity. No. It signifies how we put on Christ as unworthy servants. Just like when we are baptized, we become a new person. We put on Christ. And likewise, the celebrant is vested in Christ, representing God to humanity and humanity to God. So now part four. What happens after the priest vests? It's still part of the preparation. What happens? For him, yes, but that's done technically before. So the priest is ready. So now what needs to get ready? The community. The community shows up hopefully ready. <laughs> and part of the getting the community ready, what else do we get ready? What do we need to do, Badarak? Spiritual ready? Hmm? Spiritual ready? No, that's we're already here. Hopefully we're already spiritual ready. The yes! The bread and the wine. That has to be prepared. <laughs> You don't have to think very deeply theologically. Bread and wine, we need it, so let's prepare it. Put it on the plate, put it in the cup. 
So we prepare the gifts. And the priest asks who to be remembered. Come on, it's very easy. Uh, us. us! Those gifts, the bread, the wine, those were originally brought by the faithful to the church for the priest to prepare in order for them to also be remembered. What is another word, and I already said this, so let's see who's listening. For the first part of Badara, the teaching, what's another word for it? Synaxis. I said this earlier. What, where does the actual teaching therefore begin? After we've prepared, what comes next? Where does the teaching part of Badara begin? How do we know about our faith? Who taught us? Jesus. What did Jesus do to teach us? He spoke. Okay, that's when he was here. But what did he do? He came to the world. So the teaching begins from Ashkar Kalot, from when we sing Parech Hosutsyam, where the priest descends from the altar and walks among the people. Christ came down from heaven, right? So, it is that part. When we approach him and we ask that the priest remember us in front of the immortal Lamb of God. And then he ascends the altar, and what is said following that? The deacon says, Ortniader. The dead high blesses everyone, and then what happens? What is said? Don't open the red books. <laughs> what follows that? Miyadzin hmm? Vorti. What is that? Confession of our faith. It's a confession of our faith, the Jamamud. The entrance of the hour, which is a mini creed, let's say. It summarizes what we believe, who we believe Christ, our faith is, and especially pertaining to that day. So, somebody asked me this uh, last time, uh, I think it was George, and so I'm going to ask you all when I answered it. What is the lower entrance or the small entrance? There's two entrances. There's the great entrance, which is Vera Peru, when the gifts are brought to the altar. What is the small entrance? When the gospel is brought around and put onto the altar. Why is the reading of the gospel and scripture so important in Badarak? Hmm? It's the word. It is the word of God. And it is the earliest practice of the early church. What would happen after the gospel reading in the early church? What's something we don't do anymore? The sermon. The sermon. And what do we do today? The creed. The creed. The Havadar. And that's where we're going to begin. We've all heard it, and we recite it every Sunday from our childhood. Most of us actually know it by heart, or at least in part. How many creeds does the Armenian church have? I know, right? How many creeds does the Armenian church have? No, nope. that's sacraments. Three. The Nicene Creed, which we recite during every Badarak, and also during weddings, if the priest wants to do the long version. The Apostolic Creed, which is read during their baptisms. This is much shorter. And then what is considered the Creed of Gregory of Datev, which is a creed that the priest recites every morning during Jamir Kutsum, and it is also what the, the candidate who is becoming a priest recites as to what we believe as the Armenian Church. There are other creedal statements. All right, what did we say? Which ones are the creedal statements? We just said it. The Jamamuz. The ones we recite at the beginning of Badarak. So the creed that we do recite in Badarak is called the what? Nicene Creed. It was founded by who? Council of Nicaea. When? 325 A.D. 318 bishops, 
teachers, priests, saintly leaders came together at the behest of who? Now you have to know history. Who was the emperor in 325? Constantine. Constantine. At the Council of Nicaea. The reason for the council was during the first few centuries when Christianity was being formed, especially after Christ's disciples also died, after the first few martyrs went, after the churches found, we're saying 325, so the Armenian church has been around for 20 years at this point. There was a lot of teachings, a lot of confusion about the deeper questions of who Jesus was and how our faith expressed itself. And at the time, there was a priest, a bishop named Arian, who was teaching that Jesus was a created being, like us, and therefore was not like the Father. This was a heresy, a perversion of what the church teaches. But of course, it's not like anybody could be like, Sir Pazan, like Bishop, what are you talking about? Look what the Bible says. Why not? Hmm? What? There, there was no Bible. Old Testament existed. There were some writings, right? We talked about the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve. Certain texts existed, but the church predated today's version of the Bible. So they couldn't do that. And so, throughout history, different ecumenical councils were brought together, of which the Armenian church accepts three. Nicaea, Constantinople, and Ephesus. And don't worry, all of this information is in the reference sheets you can take home. So the, at the Council of Nicaea, the Armenian church was represented by who? Who can tell? 325, so that's right after St. Gregory the Illuminator. Who was there? His son, Aristagus. So St. Aristagus was at the council representing the Armenian church. The reason for this gathering, like I said, was because of this false teaching that was coming into the church. And just because it was saintly priests and bishops and teachers, etc., that came together, it doesn't mean these meetings were nice. In fact, these meetings oftentimes got very violent. There is a story about Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, who was at this meeting. And when Arian got up and explained his belief, remember, Arian is a bishop. So is St. Nicholas, they're bishops. When Arian got up and explained it, St. Nicholas got up and slapped him across the face and knocked him to the ground. Because he said, what you are speaking is heresy. And of course, St. Nicholas was actually his Episcopal rank was taken away from him. The other bishops could not believe what this bishop did to another bishop. So they took, they defrocked him in a sense. And it is only later, after Arian was condemned, that all those bishops had a vision of the Mother Mary giving St. Nicholas back his Episcopal rank, that those bishops realized the wrong that they had done and reinstated St. Nicholas. So just because he's Santa Claus and he's nice and gives gifts, doesn't mean he doesn't, you know, he takes flack. You know, he stands up for what is sacred. So what, so you thought, you know, parish council meetings or annual assemblies could get bad. These are worse. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is the creed, the Havadam, the profession of faith? What is it? What does it mean? What does creed mean? Hmm? I believe. It is a Latin term, credo, I believe. It is the summary, it is an irrefutable and undeniable principle articles of faith. If interpretation is used to understand the other rules of the church that can be applied to our Christian life, the creed is not one of those. Yes, we need to understand the creed, however, to be a Christian, you must accept the creed. In early Christianity, several communities even developed their own creedal statements to safeguard teachings of Christ. However, to combat heresies, personal agendas, misguided teachings, and to ultimately do what? Show uniformity of our faith. 
to show orthodoxy. That's where we become orthodox. To show orthodoxy in our faith in Christ Jesus. One doctrinal statement was formed. Now, I want to add that even here, there are some differences between other Orthodox and Catholic churches and the creeds that each of them use. Remember that the creed was created to combat false teachings. In certain areas, clarification was needed to be able to fight certain heresies. For example, in Armenia, Nestorianism, which was a heresy in the 4th, 5th century, which taught that Jesus had two separate natures and that there was no union between the two. After they were condemned at the Council of Ephesus, Nestorians found refuge in Persia. And so being so close to Armenia, the Armenian creed added a few extra lines, clarifying, not changing, but clarifying who the person of Christ Jesus is in two natures unified in the one person of Jesus Christ. Right? What do we say in the creed? <laughs> perfectly human and perfectly divine. Therefore, being a statement showing the uniformity of our faith, this part of Badra is crucial to be said by who? The people. The people everyone in the church. The congregation is what, who shows what we believe, affirms and declares the same faith that binds us all to Christ Jesus. The Havadam and all creeds are deep, uh, have deep theology, and it would take months of unending study to really understand it. And we would even need a lifetime to fully, personally accept it and understand it. However, I'm not going to keep you here that long. And I just want to go through a few major parts and how ultimately they can be applied to our life. Because these instructionals are only as important as they can be applied to our own understanding. We need to understand Badarak so that we can apply it to our own faith, to our own lives. So, right off the bat, how does the creed begin? We believe in what? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of things visible and invisible. Through this statement, we affirm the first commandment of God. God is one. This statement affirms for us that we know that God is one. That there are no other superstitions. One God and our relationship to that God is that He is our maker. Our, and maker of everything, visible and invisible. All constructs, all matter, all energy. This isn't talking about science. It's not talking about evolution. It's not talking about how it all began. It's, those things can be argued. However, what we believe that cannot be argued is regardless if you believe in evolution or creation or whatever you want to call it, God is our creator and our relationship to God is that He is the Father of everything. How do we continue from here? And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of God the Father, the only begotten, that is of the essence or the substance of the Father. Once again, we continue with the affirmation of the one God in the second person, Christ Jesus. In order for God to be a father, he has to do what? He has to have a son. He has to have a child. He was a father before all time, meaning even before creation. Meaning that Jesus Christ was there from the beginning, not created but from the beginning, same essence, same substance as the Father. Together, when we say God, we merely describe the Trinity. The name Jesus means salvation, and the name Christ, meaning anointed, means kingship. Therefore, there is not two kings, but one king, 
one God in three persons. That is why we then say that he is God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of the same nature of the Father, by whom all things came into being on heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. What does the word God in Armenian mean? Astvats. We say astvats, right? What does it mean? It is three separate words. Ast vo eats, that which creates. When we say God, it is not his name. It describes the creator, the knowledge, the beginning and the end. That is what Astvaz is. That, and when we say Jesus Christos, when we say Jesus Christ, it is the person by which we, one of the persons that we, by which we understand who God is. After all, what? Actions speak louder than words. So we continue. God in the person of Christ Jesus, who did what? For us humanity, for our salvation, came down from heaven, was incarnate, was made human, was born perfectly of the Virgin Mary. Right? We said perfect human, perfectly divine. By the Holy Spirit, by whom he took body, soul, and mind, and everything that is in man, truly and not in semblance. Meaning he was perfectly, completely human. He suffered and was crucified. He was buried and he rose again on the third day ascending into heaven with the same body and sat at the right hand of the Father. And he used to come with the same body and with the glory of the Father to judge the living and the dead of his kingdom. There is no end. There is a lot compacted in that. This portion makes up the biggest part of the Nicene Creed. As Christians, our faith is founded on our relationship with God whom we know through the Holy Spirit, how? Through the person of Christ Jesus. Meaning our foundation of knowing God, our faith, our everything, is by our belief in Jesus and everything He has done for us and everything He will do for us. If we do not believe who Jesus is, was, and forever will be, then why are we here? St. Paul says, Now if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some say that there was no resurrection of the dead? For if there was no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our faith, our preaching is in vain. And we are found to misrepresent God. However, he did rise from the dead. And our faith has, is not futile. And we are not in sin. This is in 1 Corinthians. We need to believe those, that massive statement of who Jesus is, that is the foundation of what we believe. That is what gives our faith purpose. In the private prayers of the priest, the priest says, God, our Father, who called us Christian by your Son, Christ. We bear that name. If we don't believe in what we're bearing, then we definitely have an identity crisis. We believe in the Holy Spirit, in the uncreated and the perfect, who spoke through the law, the prophets, and the gospels, who came down upon the Jordan, preached through the apostles, and lived in the saints, dwelt in the saints. Again, we are reaffirming our belief in the one God, but in the person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. It is, and it, it too is known by its actions. God the Father, action is what? Creator of everything. Christ Jesus, action is what? Savior. Savior, that whole statement I just read. Holy Spirit, action is what? 
Advocate, teacher, machitarich, consoler, everything that we have today, our faith, how we learn, actions speak louder than words. We also believe in one universal, or Catholic, apostolic, and holy church, in one baptism, in one repentance, for the remission and forgiveness of our sins, in the resurrection of the dead, in the everlasting judgment of souls and bodies, in the kingdom of heaven and in the everlasting life, or in life eternal. Havadamk concludes with ultimately what everything, all that action is being done for, is being done for us. This one church, not St. Gregory, not St. Vartan, not St. James, not St. Joachim and Anne, the one church by the one God, for one salvation, through one baptism. This idea of one keeps coming up a lot. As I stated, the creed is the one and only indisputable doctrine of the Orthodox Church, for the Armenian Orthodox Christians. And it demands that we believe in its statements. That doesn't mean that we believe in it blindly. That doesn't mean that, you know, we can't ask questions. But to be considered a Christian, we must believe it. Does this mean that if I don't believe it, I'm going to hell? That's not my decision. As the creed states, he will come and judge. However, in order to be considered part of that one holy church, to be in full communion, one must accept these terms. It's the contract, let's say. It's the contract that you need to accept, you know, where nobody reads it, but everybody clicks that button on the, uh, at the bottom of it saying, yes, I agree to all your terms and conditions. Well, this is exactly that. But we read it every Sunday. It's not about scrolling through it. We want to understand it. And we do want to understand it not because if we don't, you know, Somebody will find a loophole and we'll end up uh, getting the short end of the stick. But we want to understand it so that we can understand what it means to be one church. So when somebody comes up and asks me, are we Orthodox? Or are we Catholic? Are we Apostolic? What are we? We are one church. We are one faith, one God, one church, one Christ, one Holy Spirit, one God. All those other things, yes, they have a purpose. Yes, they have a meaning. But it is one faith in Christ Jesus through one baptism. At the conclusion of the creed, Badara continues with the deacon and his supplication and the priest silently praying for the peace to come over all the world, for all believers to gather in this church equally and become true worshipers of him. The words draw on the fact that no matter which Armenian church you are in on a Sunday morning, really no matter what church you're in, we are all standing in front of the same God. When the priest says, oh, i got to remember the words. Make us equal to your true believers that we are gathered here in peace. It's not talking about just everyone who's in here or whoever's downstairs preparing fellowship in the hall. It's talking about every church, every church that believes in the one God, one faith. So if you're in the church in Chicago and your cousin is in a church in Bangladesh and another one is in Singapore, you're all standing in front of the same altar in front of the same God. And the prayer ends with Ortnia der med Jesus Christos, Amen. Blessed be our Lord Christ Jesus, Amen. Bringing what? An end to the first part of Badara. As the deacon says to the priest, Ortniade, and the priest turning blesses the people and says, God blesses everyone. The priest then removes his crown, his cross, his slippers, as a sign of humility, 
to offer up the Badra and acknowledges that there is only one true king, Christ Jesus. And now finally, we begin part two of Badra. Who remembers what it was called? Eucharist. What's another word for it? The Armenian word. That's the Greek word for it. What does the word Eucharist actually mean? Thanksgiving. Koha Panutsum. This part is also then divided into two. Holy Communion and Conclusion. So make sure you come back in February for that final part. Part six of the Divine Liturgy. Of the, of the explanation of the Armenian Church's Badra. Because understanding each of these parts is crucial for us as faithful, as I mentioned. As we see from the words of the Creed, through history, through the life of the church, ultimately it is about our relationship with God. A relationship realized through the person of Christ Jesus, who is God in human form. God incarnate. And God desires an intimate relationship with humanity. That is why we have God incarnate. That is why St. Athanasius, who is actually the person who wrote the Nicene Creed, who actually penned it, and I think he was a deacon back then, says, God became man so that man could be like God. Meaning perfect and holy. But this means that the key to connecting to God is where? It's here in humanity. It is in the relationships we share with our parents, our siblings, our colleagues, friends, everyone. Anything that separates us from God, anything that separates us from one another, separates us from God. That is why Christ teaches us about our oneness, about one, one body, one holiness. Because to be holy, like I said last Sunday, we must be whole. And to be whole, we must be holy. Therefore, I pray that the Badarak does in fact create us a desire to be whole. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And in the words of Christ, if we want our prayers to be accepted in the presence of God, we must do what? Hmm? We must do what? Go out repair the relationships out there, then come back in here. How can we love our brother who we see, uh, hate our brother who we see, and say we love God who we do not see? We cannot. So therefore, I pray, let us all pray, that those relationships be lifted up, be repaired, so that our sacrifice, our prayer of thanksgiving can be lifted up to God, to His presence, especially in this cold January weather. Amen.